Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Well, hello and welcome. My name is Jude Blanchett. I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. Uh, I'm really excited about today's conversation uh, where we'll be talking about US competition with China, but instead of focusing on some of the more traditional domains uh, of the growing rivalry, we're gonna focus today on uh, information, disinformation, and the role that these are playing increasingly in the bilateral rivalry. And I can really think of no one better to help us unpack this issue than our guest, Congressman Will Hurd, who since 2015 has been serving as the US representative for Texas 23rd a Congressional District. Representative Hurd really brings a unique lens and background to this challenge, having served as a operations officer in the CIA for the better part of a decade with tours in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India but also brings a keen interest and in background training in all issues, technology related, especially uh, computer science, which was an early focus of his. In Congress, among other things, he serves on uh, as a ranking member for the Subcommittee on Intelligence Modernization and Readiness, which falls under the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. And I think very apposite for our discussion today, he's been a, a keen and outspoken voice on the challenge that China presents to the United States. Um, just in preparing for this, looking through some of his recent writings, you see a focus on um, not looking at the competition in the rearview mirror, but really trying to think through the next iterations of this challenge and what the United States has to be doing in terms of short and long-term investments uh, to better position us to be um, competing and, and ultimately winning in this challenge, in this competition uh, with China. Um, I saw just recently that, that the congressman called China the greatest political threat uh, the U.S. faces. And looking at his work with Representative Robin Kelly in attempting to develop a national strategy on artificial intelligence, I think both demonstrates a very deep commitment to finding bipartisan solutions to these challenges, but I think a, a really laser-like focus on what the United States needs to be doing to think through the full 21st century uh, of competition. And so it's a great honor and pleasure to be joined by Representative Hurd to unpack this crucial topic of information competition between the US and China. Uh, Congressman Hurd, thank you very much for joining us today. Look, it's, it's a pleasure to be on. It's, it's an important topic and, and it's crazy. When I was, you know, if I go back to 2008, uh, late 2008, when I made the decision to run for Congress, I was in the Hindu Kush mountains in, Af in Afghanistan. And, I never would have thought that I'd be sitting talking about technology and disinformation in China. Um, you know, most of my career was kind of terrorism and, and uh, chasing nuclear weapons prolifer proliferators. Uh, I did, you know, uh, China was, a, was, a, was a, a target for everyone in trying to better understand. Uh, but I, I would think even in my time in the CIA, we viewed China as kind of a regional superpower rather than a global superpower. And, and so my understanding of, of what I call this new Cold War um, has evolved from my time in, in the agency and they are obviously a global power. So it's great to be with you to, to chat about these topics. Well, you've already hit upon a theme that, that will, I think, run throughout our discussion today, which is the last time the United States was, was engaged in a, in a truly great power competition was with the Soviet Union. And so it's, it's apposite that you mentioned this as a, as a new Cold War. And of course, it's the new where all the interesting, challenging stuff mm. is, rather than this, this just being a repeat of, of the old Cold War. We're, we're vexed with some issues of, of economic, technological, human capital integration, which make this such a thorny issue. Well, well it's, even, it's, it's even more complicated because <clears throat> the, the US and, and Russian uh, cultures, economies were never anywhere as intertwined as the US and China is. I, I think uh, China is probably more of a, a frenemy, right? Um, it's, a, it's, it's a potential uh, customer, right, to a lot of great US businesses. Um, but it's it's absolutely an adversary as well, and so that's a unique challenge 
um, that we didn't have in, in dealing um, with uh, the USSR or, or Russia. Yeah, that, that, yeah, it's a crucial point. Um, to sort of start at the 35,000 foot elevation here as, as hopefully we, we descend down, uh, the first thing I wanted to ask you about is um, as, a, as a, a framework, a lot of the focus now, not exclusively, <clears throat> but a lot of the focus, especially in, in think tanks, but even in, in the US government is focusing, focusing on some of the more traditional domains of great power competition. So obviously over the, at the Pentagon, they're doing a lot of work on military competition. You see an increasing focus on economic competition. You, you yourself have talked a lot about how do we make North America much more competitive economically with China out, out, in, out in global markets. We see a lot of focus on diplomatic uh, competition with China. There seems to be a, a relative uh, de-emphasis or, or lack of emphasis on this information and ideological space. And so just as a framing question, I wanted to ask your top line thoughts on in those silos or buckets of these various elements of the competition, what role do you see information and, and as an adjunct ideology playing today and, and looking forward into the future between the two countries? Well, it's gonna to continue to be an increasing area that we have to deal with because it moves faster than all those other, all those elements in, in, in any other domain. And so we have to be prepared for that. And, and I don't think we are. Um, I think COVID is, is a good example of how early on we, we know the, the, the Chinese government tried to claim that this was the United States, that it started um, at a military base in Italy. Um, they also are going to our, our Western allies and say, you can't trust the, the U.S. to help you with this. We're the ones. Um, they, you know, even in, in some points, the, the Chinese had gotten support from European countries on um, the, the ventilators and PPE, and then they try to sell that back to those to those countries. And, and so this this is the, the kind of game that we, we have to be ready for. And, 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 it, and it, it starts with what is their goal and, and this the the their desire to be a world leader, the world leader, not a world leader, the world leader in advanced technology in, in about 11 areas by 2049. Right. This is not this is not my hypothesis. This is not something I collected when I was in the CIA. This is them saying this about themselves, and it starts with that. And so, why do why are they trying to do that? And and ultimately, uh, data plays a role in, in all these issues, right? Um, high powered compute uh, plays a role in all this. Um, advanced engineering like algorithms plays a role in all this. And what is at the core of all this information? And so how do you collect it? How do you weaponize it? Let's go back to the OPM hack of, of um, 2015. 22.1 million Americans who have gone through a um, security clearance. Now, what the SF-86 standard, literally stands for standard form 86, um, has information on, on family members that may be living in overseas. So the Chinese now have access to any Chinese American that may have a family member that living in China. How are they gonna use and, and, and leverage that kind of information? So not only is it collecting information to move their operations, it's weaponizing it in a way in order to move the, the narrative. And, and information operations helps in all these other domains of general great uh, power competition. And so you can prepare the actual physical battle space um, with information operations. This is what all of our military planners talk about. Um, why do we care about the fact that space is now a contested domain, just like air, land, and sea? Because space decides and, and, and influences the way information flows uh, terrestrially. And so all of these, these issues are connected. Why should we care about TikTok? I, I don't care about some fancy, you know, some dance move somebody has but it's a lot of data that is tagged on a shapes and styles of faces that the Chinese government can't get in, in the mainland. So, so all these things, things are, 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 are connected. I wanted to linger on something you mentioned at the top of your remarks, which was on uh, China's sort of narrative war coming out of COVID-19, still to this day, um, outright denying or, 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 or or at least obscuring uh, or attempting to obscure where the origins of this were, speaking in the passive voice, leaving this kind of general of, well, we don't know where this originated. Hopefully someday we'll find out. 
um, <clears throat> and you've written a lot about this, but in thinking about the playbook that China has used on overt disinformation, whether that's claiming through government officials over Twitter, that maybe this came in through the US Army, um, I wanted to get your thoughts on what does this tell us or what does this tell you about China's shifting playbook on disinformation as, as, a, as just a contextual remark. It was the case that up until very recently, um, in experts or analysts were saying, look, there's, there's a different playbook between Russia and China. Russia is much more, it's like the Pistons in the late 80s. It throws elbows, you know, it plays dirty. China, China sort of plays much more formal, much more elegant. Um, it, it seems to me that that's shifting a bit with seeing the more uh, sort of Bill Lambeer approach that, that China has been using with COVID-19. I wanted to get your thoughts on, are we seeing a, an evolution in China's aggressiveness in the dif disinformation space? And what does that mean to you? So, I, so the, the short answer is yes, but it's not new tactics for them. It is new tactics used on a world stage. They use all of these tactics internally, right? They use this in, in order to force uh, obedience in, in the homeland. We're seeing how they're evolving and, and using these tactics right now in Hong Kong. And so, so we should not be surprised that an authoritarian government is using these kind of tactics on the world stage. And I think you can go back even, for, um, I think it was 2017, when the first Chinese military base outside of Asia, outside of East Asia, in Djibouti. I think that was a wake up call for a lot of people, because again, I, I think the prevailing sentiment was that, that, Russia, I mean, that China is a major player in East Asia and they only care about East Asia. No, that's, that, 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 that was an old world thinking. Um, we all laughed at made in China, right? That, you know, that's gonna be some knockoff. Um, that's not the case anymore, especially when it comes, you know, the fear about um, um, microchips and, and things of, of, of that nature. And, and so, so the, we're gonna see, they have a playbook that has been developed over a couple of decades, and we're gonna see that being used in, 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 in a broader way. And I do believe that COVID was an opportunity for them to supercharge their efforts. And that's why I think some of these information operations are becoming more aggressive. Oh, and by the way, is it being countered properly? Yeah. Right. And, and, and negative, look, I, I learned a few things when, when I was in the CIA, be nice with nice guys, tough with tough guys. And if there's no consequences to negative behavior, that negative behavior will continue and escalate. And, and the only way that we're going to deal with this, we can't do this by ourselves. We have to be working with our, our allies. Let's start with the EU. Let's start with NATO um, and making sure that we're pushing back. Um, we got to make sure that we're in lockstep with Australia and Japan and South Korea and Vietnam on, on some of these issues um, because we, we have to have a, co a co collective response um, to, these, to this behavior. Yeah, and certainly you know, your last comment there reminds me that it, it seems that the United States has forgotten the fact that I think we hold all the, all the big major cards here. Right? It's just that we're not deploying them. You know, China has uh, a, a uh, unenviable number of, of allies, North Korea, um, whereas the United States is able to bring to, bring to the table and leverage a, a pretty robust and thick network of allies and partners, which, which creates a uh, a sort of a, a size factor and a scale factor, which which uh, certainly rivals China. But we're in a a moment where we've lost our mojo, and certainly I, I think it's clear in looking at a lot of our responses or or how we're sizing up the China challenge um, that we've forgotten all the substantial elements of national strength that we have, um, of which our allies are are just one. Um, and, and, and I I would say on that too, like we we oftentimes forget about soft power, right? When you talk about um, you know, these issues, we always talk about the dime, you know, frame of mind, diplomatic intelligence, military and economic. We oftentimes forget the economic piece. And with what the Chinese are doing with the One Belt, One Road initiative, our response to that, a, a, a new a redesigned OPIC, um, you know, is that doing enough? I was in yeah. El Salvador literally meeting with the president the day after they made the announcement of working with the Chinese on some port project, which we know was a, was a debt trap. And so are, are we doing that? And, and I would say we've made some mistakes in Eastern Europe uh, when it comes to, you know, I, I spent, I've spent a lot of time in Eastern Europe in, in, in Congress and a lot of them were like, <clears throat> why can't we get um, more old episodes of Oprah 
or Seinfeld or some of these kinds of things to, to see that American culture that we all love. And they were having a hard time. And what the Russians were doing, they were providing the, the, the programming and including Russian news. Uh, the Chinese are going to start doing something similar. And so if we don't start focusing on some of our, our that soft power, um, then, then um, we're going to, we're going to have a hard time. <clears throat> I, I've always said Seinfeld reruns are our most potent offensive soft power weapon. Um, so, um, so I, I just want to follow up just one last question on the election piece here. We're moving towards our presidential election in November. We've had some pronounced warnings from senior law enforcement and intelligence mm -hmm. officials about specifically about the, 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 con the concern of threat from China. Um, I want to get your assessment of, of how big of a concern this is and, and crucially, what steps do you think we can be taking now to protect against November, but I think also forward looking, what should we be doing about modernizing our election system to be able to withstand some of these threats? So um, I actually held the first hearings on election interference back in 2016 before the 2016 election was over. <clears throat> And one of the things that we have seen um, when it comes to hardening the vote counting machines and the tabulation machines, um, states have done a pretty good job since 2016, um, making sure that you have the ability to have a audit trail um, so that when, when a recount happens, as, and as somebody who has won an election by 900 votes, um, every vote definitely matters. And, and so we've seen that happen. The question becomes, if you're trying to influence something, somebody, uh, how does that impact your, your, ultimately your vote? And one of the things that I would like to see, um, these, these social media companies have gotten pretty good at trying to take down um, folks that are misusing and abusing those systems uh, for a, a, a nation state, you know, that is doing an information operation, right? We can monitor and we, they've understood the tactics, techniques, and procedures that these troll farms are using and trying to figure out how to, how to, how to stop this. But the piece that's missing is if a user liked or shared something that some payload from a Russian troll farm, are they notified? Mm. And the answer is no. And so I would like to see a more sophisticated notification system that if we're going to change people's behavior and not propagating the payload of a information attack, you got to be told, hey, you did this and you shared something from a, a Chinese troll farm or a Russian troll farm. And so maybe that changes individuals, people's behavior. So that is, that is obviously separate from the vote tabulation and vote counting. Um, but DHS is working with secretaries of state, secretaries of states understand that. So I feel confident in this, but it's the, it's these, these nation state actors that are trying to um, get people or to influence the outcome of potential future legislation. Uh, that's something that's a little bit, a little bit harder to do. Just to follow up on that. Um, I was in Taiwan for the election, the presidential election in January and was you know, Taiwan has been dealing with this onslaught from China, uh, a real aggressive sort of technological threat to hack the election system, but also a morale threat of trying to, um, I think, try to diminish or deteriorate confidence in, in Taiwan's democracy. What struck me during that, um, during that period in looking at what Taiwan is doing to, to push back against this is there feels like there, there's a tension between raising awareness about the threat to your election system and, and, but as a corollary, that delegitimizing the electoral system, right? The more I warn about the threats, the attacks, China, Russia, I can imagine the average voter going, well, how much do I really trust the system now? So I wanted to just get your thoughts on, do, do you see that tension existing as we start to raise the alarm bells or ring the alarm bells about China and Russia? And what do we do to make sure that we're making sure voters are aware of the risk but still confident that when you go in and you, you punch the ballot, that your vote is still counted. And, and I, I think the outcome matters, right? I think the increase in vote of people voting in 2018 over 2016, I think is a good example. And even in this COVID environment, I think you're gonna see unprecedented uh, uh, turnout. So I think as long as people are turning out, um, that's how you, you that, that's how you, uh, that's an indication that people feel comfortable. But we also have to remember the goal of the Russian and the Chinese is the same. It's to erode trust in our democratic institutions. 
And, and the way you erode trust may not be in, in changing a vote from A to B. The, the erosion of trust becomes making everybody do what exactly you just explained. Oh, you can't trust this, so should I even go out and do this, right? And, and, and I, I, think, I think the great thing about the American spirit is that people are going to say, you know, you're not going to prevent me from going out and do something. And, and so that tension, uh, while we should be, be aware of it, I don't see it on, on the ground. Um, I'm involved in a number of elections across the country. And, 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 and ultimately, it's the individual candidates whose job is to make sure they're getting people and making sure people are going out to the polls. So the fact that you have thousands of people are doing that and, and we have such a dist uh, distributed system, um, I'm not as concerned as, as what we've seen in, in a place like uh, some Eastern European countries or, or even our friends in Taiwan. You know, we've got about 14 or so minutes left and I want to pivot to this sort of offensive, what can the United States to be, be doing to invest in the future? Just one final question, I think in this same cluster of issues, which is um, our US educational system is still uh, the, the world leader here. It is not only contributing to US soft power, but US hard power through innovation, the talent that we are attracting from all over the world. At the same time, you know, we know that we do have a, a, a problem of a very small percentage of individuals coming from abroad who are abusing the system and or engaged in, in espionage to pilfer and steal IP, which is then turned against the United States. We've seen raising awareness about some of the talent programs that, that China utilizes here. And again, highlighting that this is a very, very small proportion of individuals who are engaged in, in nefarious activity. Um, as the United States has stepped up its, um, its defensive posture against some of these threats, there are concerns that we are overreaching, that we're turning away talent. And instead of the old Cold War, where it was the United States or, or that was it, students can now go to Canada, they can go to New Zealand, they can go to Australia, they can go to the UK. Um, again, thinking about these tensions, um, do you see one existing between protecting national security and maintaining an, an open, pluralistic, um, competitive education system, or do you think this, this is a this is a, a challenge that we can face and address uh, um, pretty in a pretty straightforward manner? The challenge absolutely exists, and we must address it. The United States of America has benefited from the brain drain of every other country for the last couple of decades. We need to continue that. Uh, the reason our economy has been the most important economy in the world is because we have been a leader in advanced technology. And one of the reasons we have been able to do that is we attract the best and the brightest, and they want to come, and they want to become Americans, they want to live in America, and they want to contribute to our society, our, our, our economy, our way of life. Uh, we have to make sure that continues. If the Chinese government wants to steal our technology, let's steal their engineers, right? Let's steal, you know, let's take, let's go after their top 200 AI researchers and be like, we're gonna make you a deal um, that, that you won't be able to say no and you're gonna contribute here. Same with quantum. And I think that's the kind of, uh, of, of perspective that we need to take. We can manage the, the risk of people coming, you know, uh, um, Having a young person come in through a, a, a undergraduate program and that, that the, the kind of playing that take takes years and they're going to be able to be exposed to a, 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 uh, the freedoms and, and our way of life rather than have to go back to, to China and deal with some of the realities on the ground there. So we should we should be prepared. And, and I think we should be way more opening than, than what we are in order to deal with this. This is a generation defining struggle between the United States of America and the Chinese government on who's gonna be the leader in advanced technology. Whoever comes in second place is a going to lose. And this means we have to attract talent. A, a scary stat in, in um, when it comes to venture capital, I, venture capital is kind of the pointy end of, of, of the spear when it comes to capital. Um, in 2006, 80% of venture capital was invested in the U.S. companies. In 2018, 49%. And the increase in, in the gross increase in the amount of money was like a tenfold increase. In 2006, the top 10 venture capital deals, eight of them were American companies, two were Chinese. In, 28, in, 29, in 2018, excuse me, um, three were, were American companies, top 10 of, of, of venture capital deals, 
Five were Chinese, one was uh, Singaporean, the other was an Indonesian. That is a problem. And so we have to make sure people are still wanting to come to the United States because we have the best schools. We have to make sure that we're attracting um, that talent um, because there are, more, there are more honors students in China than there are all, all students in the United States of America. Four times this, the size of, 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 of our population. And, and that means we gotta make sure we're attracting the best and the brightest. And when you look at, Eric Schmidt is, is running the uh, National Security Commission for Artificial Intelligence, right? And, and, and looking at artificial intelligence as a national security issue. And some of the recommendations are coming out with have nothing to do with pure national security. It's saying we got to have an educated workforce, right? And we do that by educating our own, but also by attracting the best and the brightest from, from, from around the world. And we have to pursue those, those, those two tracks and, and making sure that our education system is still the best in the world. It, it really, we got to be focused on that because there are some other places where you can be going and getting as good as an education, if not better, outside the United States. And that should scare all of us. Great points. Um, and I wonder if I can pivot off that now that you're talking about some of the investments the United States needs to be making mm -hmm. um, in a more offensive uh, frame of mind. I wonder if I can pivot now to just use the remaining uh, few minutes we have here to be thinking about returning to this information space and um, the Cold War. If you look back at the history of the Cold War, um, uh, information warfare, information competition, investments in soft power, um, investments in open source translation, the United States really felt all in on this and recognizing the importance of the information space in competing with the Soviet Union. Um, it seems like that muscle has atrophied a, a, a bit with the United States. Uh, that makes sense. Our, our, the nature of our, our competition and our rivalries changed. Um, certainly a focus on, on what, an area you have deep experience in, the Middle East, where, where this maybe didn't play as much of a role. Um, you know, the United States was invested in things like Radio Free Europe, the U.S. Information Agency. Um, at a broad level, thinking back on how the United States was prosecuting the Cold War against the Soviet Union and that information approach, do you see any lessons that we can be learning today or, or, th or uh, what we can be borrowing from the toolkit we used uh, for the Cold War that, that might be apposite or helpful as we think about uh, competition with China? Look, I, I think all those elements you talked about are, are the, we should be using those strategies, but make sure we're putting it into a 2020 or a 21st century context, right? And, and one of the areas that we're gonna have to learn is how do we translate our concepts and ideas, um, you know, to make sure that it resonates in, in a very different culture. Uh, look, I love movies. I, I watch so many movies. I watch bad movies. And I was watching a recent movie uh, about Ip Man. He was, he was the... the Donnie Yen. The, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it, was, it, was a, it was a movie, I think, I think it was Chinese made. And some of the concepts, you know, the, the fight scenes were amazing and all that. But the concepts didn't resonate with me. It was like, what point are they trying to make, right? And, and so we have to be, be mindful that how are we going to articulate our, our message? So part of information operations is, is not is delivery of the message, right? But making sure that message is, is, is correct and, and hits, hits its point. Um, and so, so yes, we, we should have this. We should, you know, do we really understand uh, why, why does Hong Kong matter, right? Why, and, and Hong, Kong's, Hong Kong's matters because what the Chinese do in Hong Kong is what the Chinese are going to do in Taiwan. Why does Taiwan matter? Because uh, Taiwan is, produces more silicon wafers and, and certain kind of chip that powers literally everything that we use. And if we don't have that, right, how is this going to impact this, this, this generation-defining struggle? And, and so, so we have to be paying attention to what they're already doing and, and listening to them. And, and so how can we make sure that we count it? When you have protesters in Hong Kong waving the American flag, singing the national anthem, right? Um, usually, you know, the experiences I had in the Middle East is they were burning the flag and, and saying death to America. And, and so, so that is something that, that we have to be able to take advantage of. You need the resources to do that. You need the entities within government to do that. You also need public-private partnerships in order to make that happen. Um, and, and so, and, and then we have a framework that we should look at. And then the question is, how do we adapt those principles and, and techniques um, to where we are today? Um, 
you know, building on that, um, you talked about sort of understanding uh, what's, what's, what's happening in China and understanding our messaging. The, the, the proximate reason that we're having this conversation today and the reason that my CSIS colleague Seth Jones and I are spending so much time on this information space is we, in, we originally came to this because we noticed that most of the interesting stuff that the Chinese government or the Communist Party is saying about military strategy, about its political strategy, is, is encrypted in Chinese language. Right? It's not being translated. And this in contradistinction to the Cold War where we had you know, the Foreign Broadcast Information Service or, or FIBIS, um, we, which then transformed into the open source enterprise, but which, which dwindled and atrophied. Um, Seth and I really are, are trying to emphasize the role in open source and translation. And, and you mentioned China as a frenemy. We should be having every Xi Jinping speech translated into English within 24 hours. Um, you notice that a few key documents like the Made in China 2025 plan, which, which you know, inshallah was translated into English by the Chinese government, has done more to shift the awareness from sure. foreign businesses and us here. The 19th Party Congress speech, which Xi Jinping gave, where he articulated this big grand vision uh, for rejuvenation by 2049 and a world-class military and comprehensive national power. You know, thank, thank the Lord that was all translated to English. Um, but so I wanted to ask you, um, do you see a gap as well in our investments in, in open source here? Um, and what should we be doing to, to close this gap in terms of investments in, in and outside of government? Look, you're absolutely right. And, and we shouldn't have this gap, especially with where, where machine language and, and, and language programming is, is getting in, in to be able to have some of the trans, some of these translations happen quickly and somebody go through and edit it. Um, this is, you're absolutely right. And, and, and I think there was a shift when you read them saying things themselves. That is what has changed the perspective, the, the perspective of folks up here in Washington. I actually think there, there's, there's only a handful of, of truly uh, bipartisan or maybe nonpartisan may be the right word. And the threat of China, right, and cybersecurity, I, I think, are, are, those, are those two. And part of that is from learning and understanding uh, what, they're, what they're actually saying. So, so you're right. Uh, when, when we look at, when we, when we think about research dollars, not just research dollars in these advanced technologies that we're going to need to master in order to keep our economy, the strongest economy in the world, but it's like, what are those, the, what are those um, technologies that are going to help us better understand our threat, right? And, and how are we going to better understand our adversary? And, and that starts with, uh, uh, natural language processing, and that's something that we should be doing more on, um, and and making sure that we are getting things translated. I, I I tried to get a document. Thank God we have the Congressional Research Service. That was that it took me forever to say, okay, what does this actually say? Like I want a better translation than 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 what I had. And but to, but to your point, when we hear what they say. Right? It, it makes it, 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 it's, it's, it's more impactful. Um, but, but yes, there, there are so many areas, but that means we got to make tough decisions. Um, and we need to be making sure that when federal dollars are being used for research, that that research is being made available to other folks, right? And so even if it's a private institution that ultimately is um, getting those federal dollars for that research, that information should be made available to other so that we can capitalize on those federal dollars. We said we'd only keep you for 30 minutes, and, and I noticed we're at 30 minutes and 20 seconds, but I wonder if I can sneak in a final question sure. here. Um, um, you're granted you know, one wish, um, and this will help the United, position the United States to compete and, and ultimately be victorious in this long-term competition with China. W what's the thing you look at that you say, when we write the history of, of how we were successful, what will be the element um, that, that will explain it, and, and what would you like to see happen? Um, every fourth grader is introduced is intro is um, coding is introduced to mm. every fourth grader. Like I, I think that is that is something that will would change that would change um, our our trajectory. Well, as as befits your uh, your reputation and personality, that is both a uh, a a eminently practical yet blue sky uh, uh, desire for the United <laughs> States. But um, uh, you know, Congressman Hurd, really want to thank you um, for taking time out today. Uh, I know you're 
uh, moving on to different ways of serving the country uh, in, in the future, but your, uh, your bipartisanship, your pragmatism, but your, your principled stance on these issues uh, will, will sorely be missed, but I'm sure you will be a, a prominent and important voice in these discussions and these debates moving forward. So again, I want to thank you for your service. Thank you for your time today. No, I, I appreciate you. These kinds of back and forth conversations, you gave me a lot of things to think about as well. And my goal is, you know, I'm, I'm finishing up Congress and trying to do this national strategy on artificial intelligence. So this is one area the United States stays a, a leader in. Um, but I plan on staying involved in that intersection of, of technology, national security, and, and foreign policy. So I, I really do appreciate the opportunity and, and best of luck with the rest of the conversations. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.